I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural. I don't believe in the afterworld. It's just my opinion. I don't believe that we'll all meet again when we're dead. I, I do not have these romantic notions. I don't think we'll meet someone else in another dimension. When you're dead, you're dead. Simple as. Simple as. Next <laughs> it's October 1972, 44 years ago. I'm quite good at maths. <laughs> I finished school, and as an 11 year old boy, I'm absolutely exhausted. It's been one hell of a day at the College of Knowledge, as they would have called it. First thing, it was registration. Mr. Terry Johns was my class teacher, a local man. His nickname was Cat Weasel. <laughs> a lovely man. Mr. Terry Johns. A master. I'm here. Registration was follow followed by morning assembly. All oh, things bright and beautiful. Remember it? Aye. 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 But we had Gestapo teachers at the end of our line, <laughs> watching our ev every move. <laughs> Where's your hymn now, Edwards? Lost it, sir. All creatures great and small. And on we go. We march out line by line, upstairs to the English room for the first lesson. Walk on the left, son, and I'm pushed into the left-hand side wall. English is a supply teacher. Mrs. M. Davis, Marion Davis. The first lesson, she just reads the last of the Mohicans to us. That's the lesson. She's reading it. She soon becomes known as Hiawatha. <laughs> <laughs> On to a boring music les lesson. Mr. Gerwin Thomas, famous in Camarin many years ago, fantastic musician, inventively nicknamed Gerwin. <laughs> He wants to tell us about the mastery of Handel's water music. The Baroque style. What's Baroque? Quick. Quick, is it? And he wants us to listen to the fanfare of trumpets in the first movement. We get by that. And it, it's on now, upstairs again. Remembering to walk on the left-hand side of the corridors in case I get another shove. And it's Latin. Mr. Brian Rowlands. Nicknamed, you don't know, Nijinsky. <laughs> he would fly through the school, fly downstairs, either to get away from us or to get back to the staff room, to the smoke zone of the staff room, to the card school in the corner. But Nijinsky, Latin, what was all that about? Huh? It's playtime. Off ground touch. Fifteen minutes of absolute mayhem. Not allowed to have uh, footballs or rugby balls in school in case we got muddy on the grass. But you can play off ground touch. Sweating now profusely before the next lesson, which happens to be French. Up we go again. We line up outside the language lab. We're going to have a lesson with Major Ken. Do you know Major Ken? <laughs> you don't? Well, <laughs> Mr. K.G. Davis. And he's late. K.G. Davis will turn up when he wants to turn up for the lesson. And we wait there. And as he comes around, you can hear him clip-clopping. Comes around the corner, five minutes late. 
we all stand to attention. In we go to the language lab. A wooden box with a bit of glass on the front, a microphone, cassettes, um, headphones. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> Écoutez et répétez, it says, in a French accent. <laughs> La famille m'assoit dans le jardin. Écoutez et répétez. <laughs> La famille ma so Don Le Jardin. <laughs> <laughs> it's P next. Now these people are lazy people, these teachers. <laughs> they decide it's cross country. <laughs> Three miles around the reservoirs and up towards Blue Bellwood. Anybody from Kamali knows where I am. I live on the course. I know a few shortcuts. <laughs> I tell my mates, come with me now. And we walk through the shortcut. A three miler comes a one, becomes a one and a half mile course. But we have to be clever. We've got to take our time. If we get back too soon, the teacher will know that we've cheated. And sometimes that teacher, if he's not wanting his cup of tea and a fag in the staff room, will actually get in their car and follow us around. So we've got to be careful. They'll hunt us down. And if caught cheating, it's the DAP and detention. It's lunchtime. We're third on the lunchtime rota. We're going to play touch. Tag. Hell of a game. Touch, you're on it. Chase each other. We play before lunch. We play when we're lining up to go into lunch. We play on the table that we're eating at. Touch, you're on it. Oh, get off. <laughs> we play touch as we're scraping the slops off into the slop bucket. And we play touch non-stop until the bell goes for the afternoon session. It's geography next. Mr. T.L. Evans, affectionately known as Tom Swat. A lovely man. I loved him teaching me. He had something. He knew how to teach. He knew how to keep boys interested in the lesson. Always gowned as well. It was that time of that era. Today, he's teaching us about glaciation. Is that all you say? Or oh, glaciation? Yeah. About the continental drift and the formation of the Alps. Etc. Etc. Definitely taught me something. Not that I can remember everything. It's maths next, with Mr. D.A.W. Davis, known as Tom Bowler. <laughs> no. This man's first language is definitely Welsh. He is struggling, well, he's struggling. I can't understand him very well. And he speaks so fast. And he's trying to teach me simultaneous equations <laughs> and he's scribbling them on the board all these numbers and the, and different letters and signs and I, 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 I don't know what's going on i whisper to a friend i don't know what's happening <laughs> a piece of chalk flies at me <laughs> it misses i'll get you next time it does up goes my hand. Please, sir, I don't understand. What's an A, 2A and 3B? What's, what's an A and what's a B? Well, he... Sorry, I have to page, turn the page. His reply is short and sharp and not totally sympathetic to my lack of understanding. It can be anything you want, Edwards. It can be bananas for all I care. <laughs> he laughs at his own joke. <laughs> Up 
was my hand again. I don't quite get it, sir. What do you mean? Well, he takes my naive ignorance for messing about, for being inattentive and clever. And his only way he can, he can go, it's a big sigh and it's out, Edwards, get out. And therefore, I spend the next 30 minutes outside the maths room not learning one iota. Two others join me five minutes later, and for the next 20 odd minutes, we are, we laugh at first, but then we think of the consequences. If we hear the headmaster coming down the corridor, clip, clop, clip, clop, we will have the beatings of our lives. We finish the day in the chemistry lab. It was a scary affair. This was scary. Mr. Wright. What do you think his nickname is? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Lefty. I hope nobody knows him. <coughs> Lefty. I always thought it a bit strange that a man called Mr. Wright was actually left-handed. <laughs> ah. You thought that was funny as well, didn't you? <laughs> but he was left-handed also when he vented his aggression onto young boys. And he would creep up behind them <laughs> and beat the living daylights out of them. It was scary. And you behave, I behaved in his class because I saw the beatings he dished out. In his lesson, we sit on stools, we've got shelves in front of us, we've got gas burners, we've got <coughs> cupboards underneath, but we sit there. And we watch Mr. Wright at the front of the class do the experiment. We watch him do everything. That's how we were taught. With 15 minutes to go, I'm thinking, great, I'm going to get home. Get some food in my belly. Mr. Wright then starts writing. Left-handed. I'd never seen a man write so fast on a chalkboard. Title of experiment. Uh, apparatus used. The method. The conclusion. And it's a huge board, and this board that goes all the way around as well, you know. He's done two of them so fast, and we've got 10, 15 minutes to write it all down. The bell goes, it's time to go home. But we've got to finish what's on that board. I noticed a couple of the sharper boys have finished, and they dismiss themselves. I think to myself, I want to get out of here. And I say to myself, ah, I've finished. I've only done half of it, and I'm out. Fantastic. I wait outside the classroom, I'm for all my mates to come out, so I might as well have stayed in there. And I think I'll catch up, I'll borrow somebody's work when I, when I uh, get, get a chance to, to finish it all off. Goodbyes, I said, it's time to go home. And I trudge home, kicking stones, and not walking on cracks. A busy day. It's October. I remember the time of year so well. It was my sister's birthday. And I always thought how awful it was for her on her birthday. To have had to say goodbye to her father. My father's funeral landed on my sister's birthday. Her funeral is on her birthday. Now, a few weeks later, winter is setting in. It's getting to the end of October. And it seems as if the hurt of my father's death is slowly softening. I was told, as an 11 year old, time will heal. They say you never forget 
but that time heals. I get home from school. My sister's not home yet. In those days, girls went to one school and the boys went to the other. I say hello to my mum who's in the kitchen. She tells me food will be soon. But I'm hungry, mum. You have to wait, she says. I can see sausages cooking in the frying pan and I can see the spuds simmering away in a saucepan. And I do as I'm, as I'm told, but pinch a piece of bread and butter as I go. I go into the front room to turn the TV on. It takes a while to warm up. At first there's nothing. Then there's a sort of snowstorm of white dots. Then a picture appears, sort of, and it revolves around the TV. I've been taught to tap the TV on the side and it'll stop. And that's exactly what I do. I punch the channel buttons, see what's on the three channels. I'll have number one. It's Jack and Ori. <laughs> Kenneth Williams telling a story about Agaton Sachs, uh, a detective, I think he was. You know, Kenneth, he's, oh, and ah, and all that. I've got to admit, I preferred Bernard Cribbins in Jack and Ori. <laughs> so I get up out of, out of the easy chair when, I should, when I've just collapsed, and I punch again through the channels. There's nothing else on. And when I go back to BBC One, it's Animal Magic with Johnny Morris. And he's talking like a monkey. <laughs> My mum calls me from the kitchen. Come and mash the spuds, boy. I ignore her. I'll make out I was sleeping, if she asks. The family Labrador sits by my feet. She curls up tight and keeps very close to me. I stroke her, sorry. I stroke her and tap her on the head. I love my dog. Her name, uh, uh, Pebbles. I was thinking Petra then, but that's Blue Peter's dog. <laughs> Uh, I get up to turn the channel over and they say there's Johnny Morris talking to the monkeys outside looking through the windows it's gone dark and there's a storm coming in and it's starting to pick with rain the door handle turns and my mother backs through the door carrying a tray of sausage and mash. Didn't you hear me call, she says. Sorry, Mum, I was sleeping. I have a theory at that time in my life, the women in my family, three sisters, one mother, one nana, loads of aunties, and loads of so-called aunties, have decided to feed me up, <laughs> to make me a big, strong boy. It's part of their unconscious strategy of coping with my father's death. Sausage and mash it is then, and I don't say no. The mash, it's like two continental drifts have come together, and it's, it's like Mont Blanc with all these peaks, and there's the peas in the valley below, like boulders, and the sausages, and I don't know what the sausages looked like, but they were there. Oh, and I fill my belly, and the dog opens its eyes and sniffs, and she says to me, or I imagine she says to me, oh, any chance of a bit for me, eh? <laughs> and I say, you'll have to wait. <laughs> the dog has opened his eyes, I open her eyes and watches me, listens to my mother telling me to sit up, 
smells the sausages, but then realizes she's not going to get anything off me and settles down again. I eat, I'm stuffed. I have a full stomach. I curl up in the chair. The busy day of academic life has caught up with me. My eyes are heavy, my belly full. I hear the rain outside beating on the chicken shed. I put my tray on the floor, pull a blankie over me, all cosy like. I fight the oncoming slumber, my head nods, I'm nearly falling off into sleep. I can hear the dog whining by the door. Oh, now she's scratching the door. She wants to get out. Oh, my mother will be so cross. It was the twilight zone between sleep and consciousness. And as I drift, I heard trumpets in the distance. I see figures running along, silhouetted against the skyline, and they're being chased. My mind drifts to a holiday photograph of my family in the garden. I'm holding a brand new guitar that's been presented to me as a, as a present. I'm being spoilt. My father isn't there. Everybody smiles for the camera. Why are they smiling? And as I drift, I see three priests, three wise men drowning in the sea, spiraling down to the desert of the seabed. Once they're on the seabed, they crawl into an empty Coca-Cola tin <laughs> and they sermonize in Latin. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> and, uh, I see my father's face in his coffin, as pale as pale can be. My mother turns to me with tears running down her cheeks. He's at peace now, boy. Doesn't he look peaceful? No, he's dead, I whisper to myself. How can he be at peace? The screen on the TV is covered in snow again. Random patterns of dots, the electronic white noise of static, slowly the static forms a shape that takes a form and leaves the TV. It's the form of a man. I can still hear the dog whining. I can, I can see the dog jumping from chair to chair and barking out of the window. The rain is pouring down and through the windows I can see faces drowning in a sea of rising water. They are screaming but there is no sound. I can't hear their screams. I am shivering uncontrollably. My lips are shaking. I'm quivering. And I try to scream myself, but the screams don't come out. Gradually, in front of my eyes, the static white noise of the TV has transformed itself into a shape. It's the shape of a man. In front of my eyes, the shape has become my father. 
he stands in front of me I cannot move I try to reach out to him but my hands are stuck he turns to me and smiles he strokes my head and pats me on the top he says nothing and disappears I sigh and fall into a deep deep sleep I'm only woken by pebbles licking my face. Then I hear my mother calling for me to come and get my afters. I'm coming, Mum!